This is where I got to juggle my Bible and my microphone. Praise God. Has anybody, has anybody ever made a New Year's resolution before? Anybody? Anybody make New Year's resolutions? Has anybody ever broken New Year's resolutions before? I know this is just the New Year, but has, has anybody broken their New Year's resolution already? <laughs> it's just the first day. Praise God. And we make New, New, New Year's resolutions are fun, right? They're fun. Why do we make them? We make them because uh, we want to be better people. So uh, if you ever, anybody go to the gym here? So some of you go to the gym, what you will notice that between January and February, gyms are packed. They're full of people. They're not full of new members. They're full of people who signed up like a year ago, but they've made a New Year's resolution. I'm actually going to join the gym. I'm going to go to the, my New Year's resolution is actually go to the gym instead of sponsoring the gym. Um, church attendance is higher. People say, I'm going to go to church more. I'm going to devote my life to God more. Just see people running on the road more. Uh, if you do, if you, anybody ever climb the hucks, you see a lot more people climbing the hucks because, you know, we make all these New Year's resolutions. We're going to eat better, less carbs. We're going to eat less carbs this year. Uh, maybe keep my potatoes. Maybe my white bread. Uh, okay, I'm going to eat my carbs. Okay, so, uh, uh, or we try to spend, I'm going to save my money. I'm, not, I'm going to spend my, mind, my money wiser, try to get myself out of debt. Or has anybody prayed this prayer this morning? So, Lord, Lord, I pray that may you make my waistline thinner and my wallet thicker. But please don't get it mixed up like you did last year. Okay. Has anybody prayed that before? That's, that's always kind of been my prayer every year. So, uh, but anyway. Uh, and we make these New Year's res- resolutions because we want to be better people, right? But how about instead of making a New Year's resolution, how about making a New Year's Revolution. Oh, come on. Re- revolution. What's New Year's revolution? You might be wanting to something we, we coin together. And a new, what a New Year's revolution is this? Oh, let me read it. What revolution. Revolution means this. Puro, could you just stand there and hold my mic while I preach? No, just kidding. Okay. A revolution means this. A forcible overthrow of a government or social order in favor of a new system. That's not what we're talking about. An instant of revolving. That's not what we're talking about also. A dramatic, wide-reaching change in conditions, attitudes, or operations. See, this is what we're talking about here. New Year's revolution. A dramatic, wide-reaching change in attitude. Changing the way we think about something. Something, that, uh, something that's gonna, that grips our thought that we, that we can't stop thinking about it. That, that, uh, that every night we go to bed thinking about that something's taking grip of your mind. Making a New Year's revolution. See, see, we, we do New Year's resolutions because we want to make our lives better. But how about doing something to make our world better? To, our New Year's rev- revolution is, taking, is doing something that will help our community. Something to help families around us. Something that, that will grip us. That, that instead of just doing something that's just going to help me, but to help my community. That's a New Year's revolution. Something that will take grip of, your, of every uh, fiber in your body. And to help us illustrate that, we're going to be reading from the book of Nehemiah for the next three weeks. Nehemiah is a, is a good book, isn't it? If you ever read Nehemiah, you might, you might be new to church and you've never heard of Nehemiah. Ne- Nehemiah was a Jewish man who, uh, who journaled what he had done. What, what's interesting about the book of Nehemiah, there's no miracles. You won't find any miracles in the book of Nehemiah. But what, what, would you, what, what you would find is hard work. You'll find uh, it's a book of vision. It's a book on leadership. It's a book of faith. Uh, um, so much so that, that it's part of a holy scriptures. And you see, you see the hand of God move through Nehemiah's life. So just to paint the picture of, of to set the scene of what we're going to be reading, about 605 B.C., uh, the Babylonians came in and they conquered southern Israel. So just give a bit of Israel, as we know, Israel was kind of divided in two. There was northern kingdom, southern kingdom. Northern kingdom had been overtaken by the Syrians. Um, and now, 605 BC, the Babylonians have come in and they've, and they've taken over the southern kingdom, Judah. Taken over, totally. The fact they, they came in and they displaced the people. They, they took all the people out of the country and they took the best of the best. You might, might know some of the people's names like Daniel, Shadrach, 
Meshach and Abednego took these guys, the, the best of the best, and they took them back to ba- uh, Babylonia. And everybody else, they dispersed them around the rest of the empire. And the only people that were left behind were those that were, was well, just a remnant, just a small portion of people that were left behind, those that were weak, those who couldn't do anything. They just left them behind, but they displaced the whole country. It's like Australia coming here and, and taking everybody from New Zealand um, and then taking us back to Australia. This is exactly what happened. You guys know the song. Anybody remember uh, Boney M? Has anybody remember Boney M? Boney M? Yeah, some, some young people never heard of Boney M. Yeah. By the rivers of Babylon. Remember that song? By the rivers of... See, that's straight out of the scripture. By the rivers of Babylon where we sat down. There we wept and we remembered... Zion, just trying to remember the lyrics of that song. And, and, and this, is, this is their story. They got taken out. They got taken out all their land. Now they're by the river and they're remembering Zion again. Carried away in captivity, required of us a song. But how can we sing this, the Lord's song in a strange land? Okay, so that's taken straight out of the scripture. And this is, this is what's happened. They've taken to captivity. Um, they're now in Babylonia. And the amazing thing about that is the prophet um, Jeremiah had already prophesied this. And the, and the prophet Jeremiah prophesied that for about 70 years that the Babylonians will be overtaken by the Persians. And that's exactly what had happened. The Persians came in and they conquered the Babylonians. So now we have Cyrus the Great. Cyrus the Great, he's now he's, uh, he's the, uh, the, the, uh, the king of the Persian Empire. He's taken over Babylonia. And then someone's let him know something. They've let him know something about a piece of ancient um, Hebrew scripture. In fact, it was written by the prophet Isaiah about 150 years before King Cyrus was born. And, and what it's written in, in the book of Isaiah is this. It says that Cyrus will be my shepherd. And Cyrus will be used to take my people back and rebuild my land. And then, so here's King Cyrus. He's reading this prophecy. Whoa, this has been prophesied about me. Oh, wow. And so what, this is what he does. He makes a proclamation. He says to all the Jewish people, you, if, you, if anybody who's been, been taken and exiled um, j- during the Babylonian siege, you have my permission to go back to your lands and rebuild again. Rebuild again. And that's what they did. A small remnant went back. Um, but however, the building didn't go so well because the best of the best had now settled in, in Babylonia. And I don't know about you. Um, those, it's kind of like, um, let's say, my, my ancestors, my, my father's side, that came from England, right? It's kind of like saying, okay, you can go, saying to me, you can go back to England. I was going to England. Why would I want to go back to England for? That was like my, my great-great-grandfather. What's England to me? And that's kind of like what was happening to the, to the Jewish people who are now settled. You know, it's been seven years have had passed. And, and so some of them didn't want to go back. The best of the best didn't want to go back. And so a small remnant went back, and the building didn't go so well. And so now we have Nehemiah. So if you've got Nehemiah chapter 1, turn with Nehemiah chapter 1. So this is 90 years later after King Cyrus had issued the proclamation for the people to go back. 90 years later. And it says this. The words of Nehemiah, son of Hakaliah. <laughs> okay. Hakaliah. Hakaliah. I said the Porter, we should name our son Hakaliah. In the month of uh, in the month of Kislev, in the twentieth year, while I was in the citadel of Susa. So so this is historical. This isn't a story like once upon a time. This is historical, okay? In the in the citadel of Susa. And Susa was kind of like the capital city. Hanan Hanani, Hanani. You know, too bad it wasn't like Jim. Jim, one of my, let's call him Jim. Jim, one of my brothers, came from Judah. So, so Jim came back, so one of his brothers came back from Judah with some of the other men. And I questioned them about the Jewish remnant that survived the exile and, uh, and also about Jerusalem. So we don't know whether Nehemiah had ever gone back to Israel or ever, had ever set foot there. We don't know if he's actually seen Jerusalem before. But now he's, he's, his, his brothers have come back and he's, he wants to know. So can, can you imagine, like, you know, for me, you know, if you've moved from another country, you're, you're here, and you've got friends or family coming over, you, do, you want to find out, hey, how, how's things going on back there? Where have you come from, like, if you're from South Africa? How's things going on back in South Africa? How's things going on back in the Cook Islands? How's things going on back in the US of A? How's Trump going? You know, we want, we, you know, you, you kind of interested what's going on. They said to me, those who survived the exile and are back in the province are in great trouble and in and disgrace. 
The wall of Jerusalem is broken down, and its gates have been burned with fire. So it hasn't been going so well at all. So, so here they are. The people who have gone back, the remnant that have gone back, are trying to build something on, but there's no wall. So people, they're being raided. So every step forward they take, they, they take a two-step back. So no matter what they try to do, nothing happens. They're, they're, they're struggling. They're struggling. So what does Nehemiah say? Does he say, oh, man, I'm so sorry for you guys. Tell you what, here's a donation. I mean, I'll give you a donation. And um, you know what? God bless. God bless. He doesn't do that, right? This is what it says, verse 4. When I heard these things, I sat down and wept for some days. See, Nehemiah, his heart was broken. He heard this and it broke his heart. It really did. For some days I mourned and fasted and prayed before the God of heaven. Then I said, and, and then he journals his prayer. He said, O Lord, God of heaven, the great and awesome God, who keeps his covenant of love with those who love him and obey his commands, let your ear be attentive and your eyes open to hear the prayer your servant is praying before, before you day and night for your servants, the people of Israel. And so God had, had set up, what God had done, he set up some, uh, a covenant with the people. He said, if, if you obey me and, and you listen to my commands, you'll be blessed in the lands. But if you don't, and if you repeatedly don't obey me, then, then uh, you're going to be in turmoil. In fact, you're going to be scattered amongst the nation. And that's exactly what had happened. And, and then, what I love what Nehemiah, Nehemiah does next, he prays this. I confess the sins we Israelites, including myself and my father's house, have committed against you. We have acted very wickedly towards you. We have not obeyed the commands, decrees, and the laws you gave your servant Moses. See, he begins to repent. He, he takes ownership. He's like, okay, you know what? You know, we, we, we deserve to be exiled. We didn't listen. Because what happens quite often for us, when things don't go our way, we tend to blame other people. Well, you know, if it wasn't because of this or all of that. But he, took, he takes ownership. I'm not going to blame anybody else. I'm, look, even myself, even myself and my, and my household, I repent before you. Verse 8, remember the instructions you gave your servant Moses, saying, if you're unfaithful, I will scatter you among the nations. But if you return me and obey my commands, then even if your exiled people are at the farthest horizon, I will gather them from there, bring them to the place I've chosen as a dwelling for my name. And so this is what's happening. He says, he's reminding God what he had said. He said, God, look, I'm just reminding you again what you said. You said that you will gather your people back. You said this. You said you'll gather them back. But I, I know, God, you weren't going to gather us back uh, so we can be in turmoil. And sometimes we kind of feel like that, don't we? we? We feel like we go through hardships and then things change and we think well, things are going better, but things seem to go worse. And you think, God, I thought, I thought you were for me. Uh, well, what's going on? Uh, did your word say that, that you're for us, that you'll never leave us? Why am I still in turmoil? And he reminds God again. Verse 10. They are your servants and your people whom you redeemed. By your great strength and your mighty hand. O Lord, let your ear be attentive to the prayer of the servant and the prayer of your servants who delight in revering your name. Give your servant success by granting him favor in the presence of this man. And so he asks, he then changes and he asks for a specific, a specific request for favor. Who's he going to go see? Nehemiah. What you, what you got to know about Nehemiah? He worked for the king, Ar Artaxerxes. He worked for him, the, the now king of the Persian Empire, the most powerful man in the world. And so he's going to go and he's going to request a favor from the king. He's going to ask of the king. Here's the thing. You don't ask the king anything. He's the king. The king does all the asking. Not you. He knows that if he goes before the king, it could be trouble. You don't just anybody rock up to him. In fact, he's, he, he's, the, he's got a great job. He's got a great, where he's living, he's, he's raising up his family and, and the most powerful nations of the world, most cultured nation of the world. And, and he's about to ask him something that's going to take, if he says, grants him this wish, it's going gonna, it's gonna to sacrifice a lot for himself. He's going to leave this cushy job. 
and go somewhere he knows where, where it's desolate, where people are in trouble. He knows it's going to cost him something, but because it broke his heart, because he had a revolution in his thinking, something dramatic, so dramatic, it changed the way he thought, and he couldn't stop thinking about this. It was more, more than just about himself, but about his people, about his nation, and about the Word of God. And I love how this ends. Ends up with this. I was cupbearer to the king. I was cupbearer to the king. I was in the presence of the most powerful man, but I, was, I am willing to give that up. I'm willing to give that up. Because it's more than just me. It's more than just me. And here's the thing. When it comes to a New Year's revolution, when it comes to a New Year's revolution, the question is not, what can I do for myself? But the question is this. What breaks your heart? What breaks your heart? What breaks your heart? When you look around your community, what breaks your heart? When you, when you what is it, could be family members, could be the city, what breaks your heart? And the amazing thing about when we ask this question, it kind of challenges us. And, and sometimes what stops a revolution from happening in your, in your thinking is, is, well, oh, you know what? It's always happened, right? It's always, it's always been like this. What can I do? I'm, I'm too old. I'm too young. I'm not experienced enough. I haven't got enough money. I'm too busy. You, you know, we ask all these questions like, I, not me, maybe somebody else. Lord, Something needs to be done. This, of, this breaks my heart, but I'm too busy. Well, I'm not experienced. I can't do this. Send somebody else. But you know what happens when something breaks your heart and, and you think, look, I can't do it? What happens is we, we tend to, to blame things. We're like, something should be happening here. Why is this going on? You know, the country needs to do something about this. The prime minister needs to do something about this. Or maybe it's like the church needs to do something about this. Or maybe the pastor needs to do something about this. You know, the truth, the truth, this is true. People that blame things don't change anything. I remember when, when I first became an intern here at this church, I was like, you know, I thought it was a great thing. Working, you know, I'm working for God and, and I'm just my first year as an intern and, and I, and I got sent to uh, do a conference. Got sent to do it. We got sent to a conference with the other leaders at the Life Conference up in Auckland. Back then, it was called the Pursuit of Excellence. And I said, "Yeah, I'm, I'm going for the, uh, you know, for all the other leaders of the church." And oh man, I hope to catch something from them. Or, and so I went back and stayed with my mom. She stayed in Mangere, and and I went unloading a car. And then I, and one of my old friends is walking along. There's this big Samoan guy. Big guy. Says, I think, "Whoa, you're walking." And he says, "Walking." And we start talking, and all of a sudden we caught, caught, caught up with each other, talking away. And, and I see the distance. There's these two young guys, and they're kind of walking really fast, turning around. They're walking like this, turning around. And I think that's a weird way to walk. How can you walk like that? And then they come around the corner with two other young guys. They're walking really fast like this. And then getting closer. Then right in front of us, a big fight breaks up. They're fighting, fists are going, and my mum comes out. My mum yells at ants, stay out of it, ants. Stay out of it. I was thinking, well, as if I'm going to get in there. <laughs> and then my friend goes, no weapons, boys. Keep it clean. I was going, what? And, I, and, and then the neighbors, so these boys come up from next door and they break up the fight. They say, look, you guys want to fight, fight us. And police helicopters flying above and they disperse and the paddy wagon turns up and, and uh, just a normal day in Mangere. Uh, but I remember going to the conference and I was like, I was upset. I wasn't, ha- I wasn't happy. I was thinking, this isn't good. And I started blaming. I said, what's the church doing about this? These young boys shouldn't be fighting each other. They should be fighting with each other against the enemy. And the true enemy is not flesh and blood. It's not flesh and blood. These young boys need to be in the kingdom of God. What's the church doing about this? They really challenged me. Really did. So we came back and I became the intern at the youth group. Yeah, we, we work with the youth and, and uh, you know, find something that breaks your heart. I'm not telling you to quit your job, become an activist. 
I'm not telling you, no, don't, don't get me wrong here. I, we came back and we started, we got involved in youth ministry. We eventually became the youth pastors here. You know, we didn't change the city. See, that's not what we're saying. We're not telling you you got to change, find something that changed the world. But, but everybody in this room has the potential to change somebody's world. Change somebody's world. And in the last, in those few years that we, we took youth ministry here, we, you know, we had the privilege of changing a couple of young people's lives. We didn't change like the whole city, but we changed a few young people's lives. One of them's up there playing the keys. That two years internship, the man's got a diploma. Come on, give me a hand for that, diploma. And this guy, when this guy came out, he said, look, you know, I didn't do well in school and I don't know whether I can do this. You can do this. And it was hard two years and internships are designed to be tough. And this guy did it. I'm proud of this guy. And where's Tipani? Tipani, where are you? Tipani, he's at the back there. Tipani there. He's got no vehicle. He walks from Glenview all the way here for church and so he can serve at the car parking. But what he also does, he's got a burden on his heart. What breaks his heart is seeing homeless people go hungry. So he hasn't got much, but what he does do is he volunteers his time at the serve, feeding people. He hasn't got much money himself, but he, he gives, what he does have, he gives. What breaks your heart? See, it's not enough for us just to complain. Right. Do you want to know how, how your devotion to God is measured? Your devotion to God is not measured about how many prayers you pray, how long you pray, and how much Bible you read, how, how many Sundays you turn up to church, you're, or the, what, how, where in church hierarchy, if there is such a thing, is. Your devotion to God is not measured by that. But it's measured by what you do for people. That's what your devotion to God is measured by. What you do for people. And if our vision here at this church is real love serves. And, and if you're part of the series, this sounds familiar to you. Because this is what we this is what we're trying to a culture we want to bring into to this house. If you want to be part of this church, we encourage you. Real love serves. To love God and love people. Because revolution, can you put up that revolution sign? The key to revolution is love. Is love. Love God, love people. Real love serves. Real love serves. This year, you know, look, you know, don't get me wrong. You know, people that inspire you the most are not the people that lost the most most weight or got out of debt. People that inspire you the most are people who've made a lasting difference in your life and people's other lives around you. Don't get me wrong. I, I, I really believe you know, we all need to lose weight, especially me. Don't get me wrong. I do believe we need to get out of debt. But you know, we're more than just money and a body. We're more than just that. What breaks your heart for 2017? I'm not asking you to change the world. But you can make a difference in one person's life. One person. That's where it starts. One person. I, you know, I remember that story of that, that little girl throwing starfish back into the beach. You know, some of you might know the story. She, and this man's walking along the beach and he sees all these starfish. So there was a storm last night and all the starfish got thrown on the beach. And he's thinking to himself, these starfish are going to die on this beach. The thousands of starfish, they're all going to die under the sun. Then he sees this little girl grabbing one and throwing them back in the water, grabbing another, throwing back in the water. He's think, he goes up to the little girl, little girl, what are you doing? He goes, I'm saving the starfish. And he's going, what difference are you going to make? There's thousands of them here. She picks up one starfish and he throws it in the water. Well, I made a difference to that starfish. He picks up another starfish, throws it in the water, I made a difference to that starfish. One life at a time. What breaks your heart? 2017. What's your New Year's revolution? You know, after Nehemiah had gone into the city and he rebuilt the city. 400 years later, God sends his son into Jerusalem 
to proclaim who he was so that he will die on the cross. Why? Because of our sins. Our sins broke God's heart. It broke his heart. So he sent his son to die for those things that we are ashamed of, those regrets, to set us free. What's your New Year's revolution? What breaks your heart? We're going to end in communion 2017.